eight. D7. D6. Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Mercier and today I'm at the Naval Museum of Manitoba at HMCS Chippewa in Winnipeg having a look at a fascinating piece of World War II naval ordnance. This is a hydrostatic pistol Mark VII double star. And devices like these were used in anti-submarine warfare for setting off depth charges like the one behind me. Now, the developmental history and tactical use of depth charges is a huge subject that I will try to cover at a later date. But for now, the Cliffsnotes version is that depth charges were developed during the First World War by the British and remained the primary means of attacking a submerged submarine well into the second. Now, at its most basic, a depth charge consists of a big drum full of explosives, which can be dropped off the back of the ship, launched off a special discharger, or dropped from an aircraft. And once it sinks to a certain depth, the water pressure sets off the hydrostatic pistol and the charge itself. Now, given the difficulty during this era of pinpointing the location of a submerged submarine, depth charges weren't really intended as a precision weapon. You weren't really trying to hit a submarine in one go and sink it immediately, though sometimes you did get a lucky shot. Rather, these were area effect weapons, and the idea was that the cumulative effects of multiple depth charges going off around a submarine would damage its hull to the point where it would either be swamped with water and sink, or be forced to the surface where it could be attacked with guns, rockets, bombs, or even ramming. Now, at the beginning of the Second World War in 1939, the standard British depth charge was the Mark VII, so this had an explosive charge of 290 pounds of TNT, though later versions replaced this with Minol, which is a combination of TNT, ammonium nitrate, and aluminum powder, and later Torpex, which is RDX, TNT, and aluminum powder. And the first was intended to stretch out scarce supplies of high explosives, but had the useful byproduct of extending the length of the explosive pulse, making it very useful for underwater work. Well, Torpex is actually 50% more powerful than TNT by weight, and thus greatly expanded the effective radius of any given depth charge. There were also other versions of the Mark VII, including the Mark VII Heavy, which had an additional 150 pound weight attached to it to make it sink faster and deeper, and the Mark VII Airborne, which had breakaway fairings on the nose and tail, and suspension shackles to allow it to be dropped from aircraft. And all of these different versions had a maximum operating depth of 300 feet, though this was later extended to 500 feet. Now the next development was the Mark VIII Airborne, which had a smaller 170 pound charge and was designed to be suspended from a regular 250 pound aircraft bomb rack. Now the Mark IX was a magnetically fused depth charge that really didn't see service during the Second World War, while the Mark X was designed to be discharged from a standard 21-inch torpedo tube used by most British Commonwealth warships. And this came in three varieties, the Mark X, the Mark X Star, and the Mark X Double Star, each being heavier than the last in order to allow it to sink faster and deeper. The Mark XI Airborne was a modified version of the Mark VIII with a concave or dish nose to prevent it from ricocheting off the water when dropped from an aircraft, and this came in two basic varieties, the regular Mark XI, which had a single suspension shackle for use with British bomb racks, and the Mark XI Star, which had twin suspension shackles for use with American bomb racks. The Mark XII was a small 55-pound depth charge for use against midget submarines, while the Mark XIII was a larger version of the Mark XII with a 124-pound charge for use by coastal forces, and it could also be used as a floating defensive mine. Finally, the Mark XIV was tested but never adopted by British forces before the end of the war, while the Mark XV was designed for use against U-boats charging their batteries just under the surface using a snorkel and had two depth pistols, one set for 20 feet and one set for 50 feet. And finally, that brings us to this hydrostatic pistol. Now, at the beginning of the video, I stated that this was a Mark VII double star, and I know this because that is what is stamped on the unit itself and on its carrying case. However, nowhere in the literature was I able to find any reference to a Mark VII double star hydrostatic pistol. Indeed, this is almost identical to the Mark X depth charge pistol, which was the most common in use for ship launch depth charges during the Second World War. 
Now, it is entirely possible that this designation refers not to the pistol itself, but rather to the depth charge that it was designed to be inserted into, though I've not found any references to the Mark VII depth charge having single star or double star designations, though there are a couple of possibilities here. One is that the Mark VII single star refers to the Minol filled variant and double star refers to the Torpex filled variant, or that single star refers to the heavy variant with the added weight, and double star refers to the airborne variant with the fairings over the nose and tail. But the truth is, I simply do not know, and if any of you watching are experts in World War II naval ordnance and you do know the answer, please let me know in the comments or send me an email. I would love to know exactly where this fits in the hydrostatic pistol design tree. But from here on out, I am going to be describing this as if it were a Mark 10, which it most closely resembles. Right. So this would have fit inside a channel running through the middle of the depth charge known as the primer tube. And the pistol itself comprises three basic components, the adjuster assembly, the distance tube, and the pistol assembly. Right, so looking at the outer face of the adjuster assembly, we see that we have a rotating dial with a number of settings, 50 feet, 100 feet, 150 feet, 250 feet, 350 feet, and 500 feet. And this is actually the main difference I've been able to find between this and the Mark 10, which only had four settings, 50 feet, 100 feet, 150 feet, and safe. And the depth would be adjusted using a special key like this one, though this isn't an original, this is actually a replica manufactured by one of the volunteers here at the museum. So that would slip over the keyway and you would push down and turn the dial to set the depth on the depth charge. But this one is a little bit stiff and really doesn't want to rotate. And when the charge was in storage, the dial would be fixed in the safe position using a safety clip that clipped over the dial and this safety stud. Then we'll look at how that safety mechanism works in just a little bit. Right, so to disassemble this, we first take out this set screw. And then I am certain there was a special tool to do this, but I don't have it. We unthread the faceplate. Right, so now that the faceplate is off, we can see we have our adjuster plate here, which has a number of different sized orifices, and these control the flow of water into the pistol and the depth at which the depth charge detonates. And interestingly enough, a commonly reported field expedient solution for making depth charges detonate at greater depths was to fill the water inlet holes with soap, which then had to dissolve before water could enter the pistol. Now, if we pull that out, we see that we have our retainer spring to keep this plate pressed up against the face plate. We have a screen, prevent little particulates from getting into the mechanism and clogging it. And then at the bottom of the housing, we have a hole that allows water coming through the orifices to pass into the primer tube surrounding the pistol. And when the dial is set to safe, this blank area on the adjuster plate covers that hole and prevents water from entering the pistol. And that is one half of the safety mechanism. Now, the other half of the safety mechanism is this safety rod that fits inside the distance tube. And you'll see that this has a pair of lugs on the end that fit into this cam on the bottom of the housing. So how this works is that when the adjuster plate is turned to the safe position, these cams force the lugs down and force the rod into the lower position, which interrupts the function of the pistol and stops it from going off. So to understand how that works, we need to have a look at how the pistol itself functions. Now on the outside of the pistol, we have our detonator, which sets off the depth charge proper. We have a number of water inlet holes on the outside, and we have this removable collar. And while I can unthread this, Unfortunately, I really can't disassemble this anymore because there's some very fragile rubber on the inside. So I'm going to have to rely on some drawings to show you exactly what's going on inside here. So inside this housing are a pair of concentric flange sleeves which can slide past one another in two directions. And inside these sleeves is a spring-loaded firing pin, the end of which you can see just behind the detonator. Now, this is held in place by a set of retaining balls which fit into an annular groove machined into the firing pin body. Now, the flanges on the sleeves are connected by a rubber diaphragm, which is open to these water inlet holes on the outside. So what happens here is that when the depth charge hits the water, water is going to flow through the inlet, through the selected orifice, out that hole in the bottom of the adjuster housing, into the primer tube and then into these holes and finally into the diaphragm where the water pressure is going to cause that diaphragm to expand and pull those sleeves in opposite directions. 
and this is going to compress the firing pin spring. And finally, when the sleeves have moved far enough, those balls are going to be released. And this is going to release the firing pin, which is going to spring forward and hit the detonator and set off the depth charge. And the very clever thing about this mechanism is that because the two sleeves have to move in opposite directions, they're effectively shockproof. So any large shock, such as from accidentally dropping the depth charge on the deck, the ship being hit by enemy fire, or another depth charge in the salvo going off nearby, can only ever move the assembly in one direction, and thus cannot accidentally set off the pistol, which is a really clever bit of design. Now, while these devices are generically known as hydrostatic pistols, in the case of the British versions, uh, the hydrostatic pressure doesn't really act directly on the pistol. Rather, it acts indirectly via the size of the orifice and the known sink rate of the depth charge. So these are really more accurately known as leakage or time type hydrostatic pistols. Now, while adjustable pistols like the Mark 7 and the Mark 10 were the most commonly used with ship launch depth charges, there were other designs developed, especially for use by aircraft. So, for example, there was the Mark 14 and Mark 14 Star and the Mark 16 and Mark 16 Star. And these didn't have any sort of adjustment capability. They would detonate at a fixed depth of 18 to 20 feet for the Mark 16 and 20 to 28 feet for the Mark 14. And the idea here was that without sono buoys, which really weren't adopted in large numbers until later in the war, there was really no means for an attacking aircraft to detect a deeply submerged submarine. Typically, you would ambush a submarine that was charging its batteries on the surface and attack it as it tried to submerge. And so you really didn't need a depth charge that would operate at anything more than around 30 feet. Now, these types of pistols also had a different type of safety mechanism known as back flooding. So rather than an adjustable orifice plate, the top of the pistol contained a spring-loaded plunger valve, which was normally held in the retracted position by a removable safety pin. And this would allow water to flow both into the primer tube around the pistol and also into the distance tube. This meant that if the depth charge was accidentally dropped overboard, the water pressure on both sides of the diaphragm would be equalized and the pistol could not be cocked or fired. However, if that safety pin was removed, then the valve would close and it would shut off water access to the distance tube. And this allowed the formation of the pressure differential that allowed the pistol to operate. If you're wondering what the difference is between a Mark 14 and Mark 14 Star and a Mark 16 and Mark 16 Star pistol, the latter are designed to be more easily fitted to Mark 8 aerial depth charges. They're fitted with an inertial safety clip, and they also had their distance tube soldered on to prevent water leakage, which was essential to the operation of the back flooding safety mechanism. Now, there's also a Mark 19 and a Mark 20 hydrostatic pistol, and these were designed to be fitted to the tail units of aerial depth charges. And instead of having a spring-loaded safety valve, in this case, the valve was attached to a little wind-driven turbine on the tail unit. So when the charge was dropped from an aircraft, this little vane would spin, and after around 11 revolutions, it would close the valve and arm the charge just before it hit the water. Now, despite all these safety mechanisms, there was a non-zero chance that the detonator could accidentally be set off and the entire depth charge could go off. And given that this is a couple hundred pounds of high explosives going off inside a ship, well, that's the very definition of a bad day. So most depth charges included a separate safety mechanism known as a booster extender or booster placer. So the detonator here would contain a small amount of highly sensitive primary explosive, typically mercury fulminate. However, this was not powerful enough to set off the main TNT minol or torpex charge. So a third charge made of an explosive that was more sensitive than the main charge, but less sensitive than the detonator, was placed in between them, and this was known as the booster. Now, in a depth charge, this consisted of a little metal can with a well in one end designed to fit over the detonator. And when the depth charge was in storage, this would be housed at the far end of the primer tube, far enough away that if the detonator accidentally went off, it would not set off the booster or the main charge. And this booster was attached to a mechanism, a set of bellows called the extender or the placer, which was typically held back using a safety pin or safety fork. Now, when the charge was dropped overboard, the safety fork would be removed. And as water flooded into the extender bellows, it would cause it to expand and push the booster along the primer tube towards the detonator. And finally, just prior to detonation, the two would slot one on top of another, 
allowing the charge to go off. And yes, I know exactly what this looks like. Please get it out of your system. I'll give you a couple minutes. All right, ready? Let's keep going. Right, so let's head across the pond to see what the U.S. Navy was up to during this period. Now, the U.S. Navy had two main types of ship launch depth charges during World War II, the Mark VI and, not at all confusingly, the Mark VII. The difference between the two being that the former had a 300-pound explosive charge and the latter had a 600-pound charge. Next to enter service was the Mark VIII depth charge, which was magnetically fused, but unfortunately this proved unreliable and these were only ever issued in small numbers. Then came the Mark IX, which had a streamlined teardrop shape and canted fins to impart a spin so that the charge would drop very quickly and in a straight line. The Mark X was a small 29-pound depth charge for use against frogmen and midget submarines. The Mark XI was a magnetically fused version of the Mark IX. The Mark XII was a contact-fused version of the Mark XI. The Mark XIII and XV were subcaliber depth charges used for practice, passive sonar detection, and signaling. The Mark XIV was an acoustic-fused depth charge that never saw service during the war. And the main American airborne depth charges of World War II were the Mark 17, 41, 44, and 47 which had a 235-pound TNT charge and differed mainly in minor details like nose shape and tail unit construction. Now, most of these charges were designed to be set off by either the Mark VI, the Mark VI Mod 1, or the Mark VI Mod 2 hydrostatic pistol. The difference between the three being that the Mark VI had a maximum operating depth of 300 feet, the Mod 1 600 feet, and the Mod 2 1000 feet. If we have a look at a cross-section of this pistol, we can see that the lower section is very similar to its British counterparts, with two sliding sleeves, a spring-loaded firing pin, and a set of retaining balls. However, rather than being acted directly upon by a rubber diaphragm, these sleeves were moved by a rubber bellows at the top of the device. And unlike their British counterparts, American hydrostatic pistols actually were hydrostatic pistols in that they were acted directly upon by the pressure of the surrounding water. Now, one consequence of this design is that the two sleeves do not need to move in opposite directions for the pistol to work, meaning that they are far less shock resistant than British designs. Now, at the top of the pistol is a spring-loaded inlet valve, and normally this would be covered by a safety cap to prevent water from getting into the pistol and setting it off. And when depth chargers were intended to be rolled off a stern rack, they would be fitted with a special safety cap with a little stem sticking out of it. And this would be broken off by the depth charge rack as the charges rolled off of it, meaning that they would be armed right before they hit the water. If instead they were meant to be launched from a projector, then they would be fitted with a regular safety cap that then had to be manually removed right before launching. Now, under normal circumstances, this valve allowed a steady trickle of water to enter the pistol, but if the pistol was subjected to a large surge or shock, such as from a nearby depth charge exploding, then it would slam shut and prevent the pistol from being set off prematurely. Now, as the depth charge filled with water, the water pressure would cause the bellows to start expanding and push a piston towards the pistol mechanism, sliding the sleeves past one another and cocking and releasing the firing pin. Now, the depth at which this occurred was adjusted by turning the adjusting sleeve, which had a spiral cam groove machined into it, so that when you turn the sleeve using a special wrench, it would adjust the starting position of the bellows and piston. The lower the starting position of the piston, that is, the more expanded the bellows when the depth charge hit the water, the shallower the detonation depth would be. And conversely, when the dial was turned all the way to the safe position, the piston and the bellows would be retracted to such an extent that they could no longer expand far enough to activate the pistol, and thus the pistol could not accidentally go off. And that, in a nutshell, is how World War II Allied depth charges worked. Now, depth charges would continue to be used until the end of the war and for several years afterwards, but starting in 1943, they gradually started to be supplemented and replaced by more direct fire weapons such as the Hedgehog Mortar, which I have behind me. And weapons like the Hedgehog had two main advantages over traditional depth charges. One is that they could be launched ahead at a submarine while it was still caught in the ASDIC or sonar beam. Traditionally, you would have to wait until the submarine had passed into your blind spot in order to drop a depth charge salvo on it. This gave the submarine plenty of time to take evasive action. Second, the Hedgehog was a contact-fused weapon, meaning it would only go off if it actually hit the submarine. 
a depth charge by contrast goes off whether it hits something or not. And this created a loud noise and a large cloud of bubbles that effectively blinded both hydrophones and ASDIC for several minutes. Near the end of the war and immediately afterwards, Hedgehog would be replaced by weapons such as Squid, which we have over here, whose projectiles are a combination of a contact-fused Hedgehog projectile and a depth charge. And later the Limbo system, before finally being replaced by anti-submarine missiles such as the Azrock and the Ikara, and finally sophisticated homing torpedoes. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and a huge shout out to the Naval Museum of Manitoba for allowing me to check out such fascinating pieces from their collection like this. I'll see you next time in another video where we'll look at yet more naval ordnance and other fascinating devices just like this. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.